Travancore is there a more palpably romantic name for a kingdom, set in the fairy tale landscape of what is now modern Kerala? The erstwhile rulers and present-day royal family live a humble life compared to a century ago, when boy princes had tiger cubs, not puppies, and lives were changed forever by royal proclamations. In 1750, the incumbent Maharaja Varma was victorious in battle against the conquering Thampis. He attributed his success to the devotion and worship of Sri Padmanabha. In homage to his deity, he proceeded to the temple and, laying down his sword in front of the icon, pledged the tenure of the title Maharaja to the service of the Lord. Ever since, this has been taken literally by all subsequent Maharajas, and they have lived up to the title Padmanabha Dasa. Devoting their lives to the service and well-being of the state and its people. The Sri Padmanabha Swami Temple is the very important temple in our state. That is very much connected with the royal family. As a family, we are basically very, very involved with the temple. Somebody asked us, "Oh, the Sri Patnav Swami Temple belongs to you," and I said, "No, the temple does not belong to us. We belong to the temple." I would also like to say something about my father. No, that's not because he's my father, but have you noticed that he lives in a very simple manner? He has left the big palace just to be with his daughter. He could have stayed in the big palace. That shows that you know he believes. He always tells me uh, he believes in simple living and high thinking. He says, "Live simply. It doesn't matter. It's what you really are inside that matters." The royal family is involved in all the social activities. They are very, very model to everybody. They are simple life. They are humble approach. Everybody is appreciate appreciating their that attitude. The religious title of the king was Padmanabha Dasa. Mm -hmm. The religious title of the queen was Padmanabha Sevini. Sevini means she who serves. Dasa means slave. Every day the man. who is the king or the padmanabha dasa because the titles have gone after 1947 the king goes to lord padmanabha and reports about what happened in that one whole day if by any chance my great uncle is not able to go to the temple he has to pay a fine he wears a cap which has the feet of the lord on top so that the feet of the lord are right on his head and then he first goes to the lord patmanabha's shrine that is vishnu sleeping on a snake and then he comes out and then he brushes his feet because he does not want to carry even a grain of the sand of the temple back to his home inadvertently in our family and all the from the time we can remember we have lived and grown up in the aura of uh, religion and god but nama swami uh, that uh, so it, it's it's a part of our very being contemporary kerala is a panorama of contrasts virtually 100% literate and the most educated state in india with the highest percentage of electorate who turn out to vote for intermittent terms of congress or communist party Keralites have a noble threshold of spiritual tolerance. The character of the state is defined by its juxtapositions: the mosque that shares the wall with the Hindu temple, the oldest synagogue in India, and more than six million worshiping Christians. Born in 1922, Martha and Devarma Sri Uthradom Tirunal is the current Sri Padmanabha Dasa, devoted servant of the deity. Following royal tradition, the baby prince was presented on a silver platter to his uncle, His Highness Sri Mulam Tirunal, the Maharaja of the time, for naming. Only a few names are available to royal babies, 
and Mothan Devama was chosen for the auspicious properties of longevity and wisdom. At one year, the royal toddler was offered by his mother as an obedient servant to the presiding deity, Lord Padnamaba. A much-travelled and erudite scholar, a military buff with unique manners and charm, he assumed the title of Maharaja after the death of his elder brother, the last ruler, His Highness Chitra Tirunal, in 1991. Although the title is technically redundant today, His Highness is probably the last in this royal line who will command the respect and obeisance of Hindu Keralites. His 100th anniversary is falling on the 12th of November and he was 10 years older than me and he, to me, he comes with a uh, three-faced appearance. One, he is my beloved brother. Two, he is my head of the family. Three, he is my ruler. When you were growing up, were you very close to him? Yes, I had a kind of relationship with him, which is rather difficult to explain, because in 19, he was born in 1912. When he was 12, his uncle died, the late ruler, and so he became the officially the next. But he was too young, he was only 12. So the government decided in Delhi that there should be a period of regency till he becomes 18. So my mother's eldest sister became the regent. And then he got into study to get ready for his take over. Then he went to Mysore, which was a well organized, administered state. And he did about nearly one year of administrative learning training in Mysore. And that is how he got ready to take over the responsibility when he became 18 in 1931. In 1936, five years after his investiture at the age of 18, the teenage king and last ruler of Travancore, His Highness Chittura Tirunal, fulfilled his childhood promise to Gandhi and defied the established hierarchical caste system by allowing all castes to worship at the Sri Padmanabha Swami Temple. This was a revolutionary, humanitarian, progressive move that eventually spread all over India. His Highness Chittura Tirunal, the last Maharaja, passed away in 1991. His younger brother Uthradom Tirunal succeeds him as the current Padmanabha Dasa. He came in the year 1924 and then he said, why are certain people encircled and say, you can't come, you can't come. God is everywhere, God is everybody. So my granduncle, he passed, had passed away in 24, and my father's cousin sister was looking after the state as a regent. So he asked her, don't you think it right that you should do this? She said, well, I am not the ruler, I am only for the ruler. So I will carry on the administration, but I will carry out no new changes. To ask him, he's standing here. So Gandhiji asked him, when you become the person in charge of running the state, will you allow everybody go to the places of worship? He said, yes. In 31, he was given powers by the government of India, because the, the English held the idea that only of 18, you are fit to rule. So in 36, on the fifth year of his being in charge, he gave the proclamation. Then he came here and he said two remarkable things. He said, what I have been wanting to do, you have been able to do. And people call me Mahatma. That means a, a big person is calling you that. And he took the first batch of people to the temple himself. It was an act of friendship, an act of justice, an act of righteousness, that you do not deny somebody the right to go to God. It's wrong. He's everywhere. He's everybody. My favorite deity was what you see in the temple here, Patmanabha Swami. He's three in one. When I became about 2021, 20, I started doing regular 
accepted formal prayers. Through the gamut of time from 1930 when I got to know what was happening to 47, it was one series of happenings. Then suddenly it changed completely and um, everything was changed. Everything became different and we had to make a very quick, rapid change in our outlook on life. That was done. But because of faith, we would take it coolly and calmly. In 1947, India gained her independence from the British. In return for surrendering their sovereignty, princely states were allowed some privileges that lasted until 1969. The architects of India's post-independent politics, the Nehru family and Mrs Gandhi, still attract contrasting views in the true tradition of Kerala and vociferousness. The British had a very, a very cordial relationship with the Royal House of Travancore. And I think uh, part of the reason was the fact that uh, the Royal House ran the state pretty well and they were quite progressive. And that appealed to uh, a certain section of uh, English officials who really wanted to see improvements in India. So as a consequence, Travancore had its own poster stamps, its own army, in, in, in fact, its own navy, its own coinage. So there was a very wide degree of, uh, of freedom given to Travancore by the British. The Maharaja of Travancore was the Raj Pramukh of the, uh, of the, of the state. In other words, he was the, the, the head of the state, a formal head of the state. Although, of course, there was a chief minister and elected assembly which really ran the state. But technically, he was the head of the state. In a sense, you could call him a mini monarch of, of the state. So that continued for quite a while. After all, he was born a monarch. He was born into a family that ran the state for a millennium. So a complete change in that took place after 1947. And he was at the mercy of a central government that was certainly much less sympathetic to the royal houses and the royal privileges than, was, than, than the British were. So it must have had a negative impact on him. The one in the white coat is my brother, the one in the black coat is Maharaja Kuchet. And Pandiji is in the middle. Right. Why was he such a remarkable person? Who? Nehru. Highly westernized, highly easternized. Uh, his outlook on life was very, very western. He studied in England and he thought that was a good way of doing things. But then when he became under the contact and uh, guidance of Gandhiji, he became Indianized and he wanted India's freedom. He wanted India to be on top of the world. A bit of a philosopher in most things. Almost a lotus eater. Nehru definitely had an utter contempt for the Indian feudals. Now Pandit Nehru, in my view, was much more English then he was Indian. I mean, if you look in terms of percentages, he was probably 95% English and 5% Indian. So, but there is, as I said, a class of Englishmen that really appreciated traditions in India, that appreciated Indian culture. There was also a class of Englishmen who, which, who really did not know very much about this tradition, but who were determined to dislike it without finding out more about it. And Pandit Nehru belonged in the second part. And that contempt uh, definitely, uh, you know, w was present in his relationship with the royal families. And he had a very bad relationship with royal families in general. Unfortunately, that negative feeling towards the royal families was carried forward uh, by his daughter, Mrs. Gandhi. Many things he did were not as efficient as his daughter. She was a very capable administrator and a person of a great deal of understanding. Uh, she could size up a person and deal with him because he was different from somebody else. My own experience, uh, when it was decided to finish us off in uh, 49, 15, that was all right. We surrendered uh, everything for the sake of the country as a whole. 
Then came 54-55 and in 71, they said, these people are useless, so let's stop them. Stop their allowances and let them go and beg. Not knowing the number of people were honest people who had no amassed wealth. So, we formed a union. A royal union. Yes, called the Concord of Princes for India. And the Maharaja Baroda was the number one. And I used to go, because my brother said it's a waste of time. Uh, the bureaucrat wanted us finished. And um, when I used to meet Indira Gandhi, to all other brother princes, she would say, when did you come, how are you, that kind of thing. But to me, she'd ask three questions. When did you come? The temple all right, your brother all right. Then she deal with the what was the subject to be brought up. Because she knew that was our be all and end all of life. Nothing is more important. Nothing is more emotionally involved to us as the temple. And she was able to understand that. And um, at that time there was a a crisis when the local government wanted to nationalize the temple, take it away. So my brother said, go and do something about it. Indira was her devotee. So we did saw her. And in one month it was stopped. She was a very dynamic person. The frailty of the mind goes to the body. And this, what happened to him and this, people and what happened to him in the temple broke him internally. He never showed it. He never expressed himself, but I knew the pain he went through. Mrs. Gandhi was a bit petty in her personal relationships and several of the royal families uh, got on her nerves, especially the Rajmata of, of Gwalior and the, you know, and the Maharani of Jaipur. Both of them and a few other Maharanis and others got on, on her nerves. What also got on nerves is the fact that most of the Maharajas naturally were not in favour of her socialism. And some of them had the audacity in her eyes to start a political party called the Satantra Party which challenged the state socialism. Now Mrs. Gandhi believed that if the Viceroy had powers, the Nehru family was the inheritors of the Viceroy. And just as Lord Curzon believed that, look, the natives have no right to challenge me, I am Lord Curzon, Mrs. Gandhi believed what right have these native, including native princes, to challenge me? I am the, I am the heir to cousin. I am the Nehru, you know. I mean, the Lord Nehru, so to speak, or the, or the Lady Nehru. So, unfortunately, you know, she had a very negative view of this. And I think that is part of the fact we lost something very big in India. You know, we are talking of a Chinese cultural revolution around the same time. In uh, 1969, there was a huge cultural revolution in China. India has also gone through a cultural revolution. We have kind of abolished a very rich part of the past. We abolished a very, very vibrant and throbbing part of our culture in 1969 when Mrs. Gandhi, with a stroke of the pen, decided that all this has got to be consigned to the dustbin. If we had had some royal families, if we had had some flags, if we had had some traditions maintained, this country would have been culturally much richer as a result. So frankly, if Mao Zedong launched a cultural revolution in China, Indira Gandhi launched a cultural revolution in India, and both have impoverished the culture of their own respective countries. And the Maharaja Kuchin, when he came here, he was told by Mr. Menon, uh, please sign the instrument of accession. So he said, um, he took the pen and he put it in sign. Uh, Menon said, why don't you sign? He said, one minute. Let me wipe my eyes, I'm crying. My, my people who will suffer now, God help them. That's what he wanted to say. Very, very touching. In the year 1949, the then Home Minister, uh, Sir Vallabhai Patel, is popularly known as Sardar Vallabhai Patel, or the Iron Man of the Nehru Cabinet. Uh, he, he granted certain privileges to the rulers, former rulers. And uh, Indira Gandhi had a personal quarrel with uh, some of these princes. They fought in the election. They became a member of parliament. Uh, and uh, 
they even uh, made some uh, real uh, threats or uh, they created some problems uh, to the then that government and uh, and the then prime minister so uh, she decided first introduce the bill in the parliament and then he even changed the constitutional protection in 1971 we were politically stripped of name and position and income everything went very few people uh, attach great importance to royalty because this is a democratic setup you see but the travancore royalty most of the times they conducted themselves in a to a great extent in a dignified manner a great furore began in 2011 when some parties insisted the temple treasure that had been accumulated and curated over the years by the royal family and the padmama badasa be catalogued and evaluated in the year 1949 they surrendered their uh, land uh, to the union territory of india and uh, at the same time the government of india issued a covenant uh, they expressed uh, their uh, willingness to honor the uh, ex the uh, honor the special relation of the royal family with this particular temple members of the royal family are uh, aware of the treasure and uh, historians like um, we know the uh, but we don't know the exact quantity uh, or the value of the treasure and the reality is this treasure was basically the gifts to the temple by the royal family itself if they were not gifts from the public they were gifts from the royal family itself you know various kings used to place uh, gifts to the temple in thanksgiving for all the beneficence that has come on them including if i may say so the fact that they were allowed to get i mean to uh, to run a fairly independent state that treasure can be divided into three categories one belonging to the royalty what they got what they had second when they undertook aggressions conquered other regions what they were able to confiscate third category is donation by devotees to shri padmana so these are three categories of wealth this has remained without being looted without being you know uh, what do i say without any borrowings or or anything taking place for several hundred years you contrast that with the country today you contrast that for example with temples run by the state now you got much bigger temples than sri padanaba temple like tirumala and other temples are run by the state where the treasure is much smaller now it could not have been much smaller it must have been much larger but over time the treasures of indian temples have been stolen repeatedly by the people who have got who have who have taken charge of them the fact of the matter is that most of it is protected and safeguarded and kept there that was not looted by the royalty so the credit should go to them so i i think the royal family by the fact that it preserved this treasure has given a very good example of honesty and of you know and that is a example which i wish our political class and our official class would understand because the example that they have given is is very clear in the much poorer temples much poorer but larger temples that are run by the government and all, all over the country so as compared to the loot of the official and political class the forbearance of the royal family the honesty of the royal family i think is a very very good lesson for the whole of uh, society few particular persons uh, actually went to the court in fact they had some personal grudges towards the royal family 
that is the real truth. They in fact uh, uh, asked the government to consider the legality of the uh, ownership, ownership of the temple and the ownership of the treasure mm -hmm. and uh, the division bench of the Supreme Court uh, ordered for a detailed evaluation of the treasure which is even today going on. It is meaningless to keep that wealth without deriving any benefit for society out of that. Immediately we have to be very careful. Spiritually relevant material we should not touch because so many people attach much spiritual importance to those objects. The biggest issue now is that this treasure has been found. Um, the security issue is huge. Right now, uh, devotees visiting the temple have a hard time because uh, uh, you know they're being frisked, they're being searched. You cannot. There's no free movement. Things are also so bad that you can put 30 kilos of semtec and wear a dhoti around it and go through and blow up the whole thing. One thing, the one thing in my mind which is very clear is that all of it belongs to the Lord. It is not ours. We're just a caretaker. They are spending a huge amount uh, to conduct daily worship and to just to main, to perform the rituals. To them, the temple is everything. After India got its independence and Travancore was no longer kingdom by itself, the kings still called themselves Padmanabhadasa because of their love or I would say obsession with the deity of this temple. The greatest title that they could get was that of the servant or the dasa of the Lord. Arat is a twice yearly festival colourfully celebrated in Kerala. On the tenth day, three portable deities from the temple are carried on palanquins five kilometres to the beach. A large following of devotees on foot accompanies the procession, which is unusually allowed to cross the international airport runway, closed for the occasion. The deities are securely embraced by the priest and purified by submersion in the Indian Ocean before returning to the temple. Coming in front are that of Krishna and Mahavishnu. The one behind is that of Narasimha, the Manticore. Arat literally means to have a bath. And the ninth day of this festival is Palliveta where God goes out and the great, my great uncle, the Maharaja, symbolically uses a bow and arrow on a coconut. And the coconut signifies all evil. There's a mock forest kept there and Veta signifies the hunt. The king uh, actually aims the arrow onto the coconut and the coconut is, signifies evil and evil is killed. Is there any place in the world, according to our concept, where there is no God? He is everywhere. He is in you, he is in me, he is in the table, he is in the cloth, he is in my slippers, he is in the floor, he is everywhere. 
how do you worship him? What are you going to concentrate your mind on? So we found out to give him a body, a, a, an atmospheric idea of Godhead, so that you choose the particular picture or the particular form you like, so the understanding becomes easier to assimilate. That's all, not because they're different. It's only one. His favorite god is Lord Patnabha. My great uncle, my older great uncle, who is no more, who is the last Maharaja of Chamikor, and my present great uncle is, I mean, does not just believe and love the deity. He is obsessed about the deity. He is mad about the deity. And this is one occasion when he is able to come to the temple three times a day. Normally, what happens is he comes to the temple once a day in the morning, and because everything is, so, you know, everything is so special, the darshan is so special, he does not come more often. But this festival is a time when he is supposed to come three times a day, and he loves it. It's proximity to his Lord. So th they have to take this uh, uh, small movable idol during the festival time up to the seashore and uh, they have to dip these uh, movable idols in the sea. The Padmanabha Swami temple, they conduct uh, our art festival once in six months. So annually they have to conduct two our art festivals. And, uh, here, which has some political significance also. The Padmanabha Swami was the constitutional head of this part of India. Actually, the Travancore prepared a constitution in the year 1948. Till then, they don't have any written constitution. But just like great in, in Great Britain, they too have an unwritten code of rules. And according to those laws, the deity of the Padmanabha Swami temple, people uh, consider him as the head of the state. After the surrender, the Arata festival attained a special status. And the state uh, police force is providing all kinds of assistance. In those days, army used to participate in the procession and for in, in, there are Christians, there are Muslims in the army and in the police force and uh, they happily uh, participated in the Arat festival. Strictly speaking, Arat festival is not a Hindu festival. After the independence, um, uh, government of India is, is giving all kinds of assistance. They, they will open the doors of the airport. The unusual complete silence of this part of the festival is appreciated by all the devotees. Arat is basically the bath after the hunt. The Lord is taken uh, outside the temple, goes to the beach and has a ritual bath and for cleansing and then only enters back to the sanctum sanctorum with the bow and arrow. When you look back at your unique, extraordinary life, what are the moments that really stand out for you? How I learned to become a man who could surrender in faith. That started very early and that's what keeps me going. Because you find people like me in other parts of India who have all gone into as oblivion, or they've gone into business, or they've gone to tourism, but we stuck to this completely throughout. Um, I want you to think a little bit about your very large family. The elder niece has got a daughter and a son. The younger niece has got two boys. The elder one has no grandchildren. The younger one has got twins. Your great-great nieces. Yes, they like to be spoilt because 
They are not with discipline like me. They have a very easy time, very comfortable time. But I had a tough time. But I was very boisterous and I was very obstinate. So I succeeded. What sort of involvement do they have with the temple? Will they inherit some of your belief? We trust and hope so. Do you get to see very much of them? Yes. I went to watch them feeding the temple mm, elephant yeah. and they were very boisterous mm. and very charming. Uh, so perhaps they have inherited a few of your characteristics? I think so. The only thing is that uh, there is what is called the generation gap. That is a problem. Because what is correct is correct. It can't change. Discipline. There is a question of disobedience. Said, it's done. That's all. So do you think that's um, being instilled in the youth of today? Do no. You think? Possibly it's almost getting to the reverse. They tell you what to do. That's a pity. Generation gap. My uncle, as I told you earlier, he has the body of a 91-year-old with the mind of a 19-year-old. He's so enthusiastic. He wants to do everything. Sometimes, uh, like an elephant, which does not realize its own power or limitations, he just wants to go everywhere, he wants to meet everybody, he wants to do everything. He is so full of enthusiasm. So this morning I had went to the temple, came back and had breakfast. Then I went to the Episcopal Palace of one of the bishops here. We have 70 types of Christians here. And uh, he very kindly wanted that I should flag off a, a, a march to say that Kolichil, that pillar should be saved. I said, yes. Then from there I came here. Now I go back. Then something happens all the time. Otherwise we'll be old. I feel unhappy because what have we achieved for the man in the street? Nothing. He is being drained he has been given unequal social incomes so that the haves and have nots are being more and more apart, not getting nearer. It's, it's unfortunate that when people could be happy, they are not, because their wants are becoming unaccountable. Is there any counsel or advice you would offer to young people starting out their life today? Remember the past, live in the present. The past and the present will give you a good future. That's what I think should, what a person should look forward to. You don't think of this today. There is good to be tomorrow. There was a yesterday, so don't forget that.